Good afternoon. Uh, today, I would like to talk about subjectification and intersubjectification. And I added the word rethinking to this slide. Uh, I'm going to start by talking about intersubjectivity and subjectivity. Uh, those are synchronic notions, as I will insist later on, and then talk about subjectification, which I would ins will insist is a diachronic concept, and intersubjectification, which is also a diachronic historical concept. And I'm going to look very briefly at two developments, the discourse marker by the way, which is a digressive and a hedge, and is a good example of intersubjectification after subjectification, and look at the emphasizer pure, as in pure nonsense, which is not undiluted, <laughs> but extreme nonsense. And then I will conclude. Uh, when Graham Trousdale and I were working on constructionalization and the book that ended up as Constructionalization and Constructional Changes, we said almost nothing about the topic, the topic of subjectification and intersubjectification. I looked it up in the index recently, it isn't there. Uh, we really we're not thinking about it. But I got an email from Jing Chunyang Chunyang in February, who asked about the role of subjectification and constructionalization. And I really appreciate that question because it got me rethinking my older work. I realized that this older work was very heavily influenced by a grammaticalization perspective. The older work started in the 1970s, late 1970s, and con continued through the 80s and 90s, and was completely influenced by grammaticalization and the question of what comes first. Is it subjectification or intersubjectification? I was thinking about it in terms of uh, directionality. But thinking about it in terms of constructionalization and constructional changes has given me a rather different and a new perspective, which is what I want to talk about today. The phenomena are, of course, the same. But the point is that directionality is much less important. In fact, I was wrong about directionality, as was pointed out by various people. And now what matters to me is discourse function. That, I will show, plays a crucial role in thinking about these two topics in the context of constructionalization and constructional changes. I now see them not as enabling mechanisms, but as outcomes of shifts in linguistic function, as interlocutors innovate constructs and conventionalize them as constructions. So I interpret them now as the outcomes of the development of new symbolic links between form and meaning, the constructionalizations, and sometimes of post-constructionalization constructional changes. They are intertwined with the tasks to which constructions are put. Hazelow 2019 talks about the importance of thinking about the tasks of communication in turn taking. I'm not talking about turn taking because I don't have much turn taking in uh, historical work. But I think he's right uh, that it is useful to think about what the purpose of using a construction is. So what is its discourse function, whether or not we're turn-taking? It can be the question of 
what happens when you're writing. We are, of course, always writing for readers. Uh, those are co we have communicative tasks in mind when we are writing. Uh, so I'm going to start with the phenomena to be investigated. Here there's little difference from my earlier work, although my thinking has been enriched by a number of perspectives, some of which I will mention. I don't have time to mention them all, but just a few. Uh, I will repeat what I have said for many, many years now. I've said it since the 70s. Subjectivity and intersubjectivity, the synchronic ideas and subjectification and intersubjectification, the historical ideas, are gradient, they're on a continuum from low to high. And this is going to be very important in what I discuss today. Uh, much more important than it was in the past. Now, as background, it's extremely important to recognize that all language use is subjective to some degree. Speakers and writers choose what to say and is intersubjective because speakers and writers choose whom to address and how politely, rudely, and so forth. And the addressee reader interprets. This is something that Bonvenise pointed out. Uh, he's there on the left at the bottom, uh, back in 1958. Negotiation of meaning always involves some degree of intersubjectivity. As Verhagen pointed out, he's on the right. Tailoring of point of view with respect to other interlocutors is foundational to language. Uh, this is also called building common ground, common ground between the speaker and the hearer. That goes on all the time. That's what I would call ambient intersubjectivity and ambient subjectivity. That's a synchronic notion. Now, people have been thinking about subjectivity for a long time. In European linguistics, thoughts about subjectivity go back at least to Briand, who wrote a book in 1900 uh, called Subjectivity, Semantics. And uh, that's a picture of him on the left. It also has a very rich history in Japanese something that unfortunately tends to get forgotten. But Shinzato, who's on the right, uh, points out that the Japanese linguist Minoru Watanabe in the 1950s distinguished subjectivity and intersubjectivity, much as Bonveniste did, uh, but a little bit earlier than Bonveniste. The point is speaker speaks and addressee uh, interprets. Unfortunately, Watanabe wrote in Japanese, which means that people like me have been unable to read that work, but it has been very important in uh, the Japanese literature. Now, going back to European studies, Desmet on the left and Vestaleta on the right, in 2000, and six, in an article in Cognitive Linguistics, uh, distinguished two main types of subjectivity. Pragmatic subjectivity, which is inherent in language and independent of the semantics of a particular expression. And that is what I called ambient intersubjectivity. And then they talk about semantic subjectivity. This, they suggest, is ideational using Halliday and Hassan's term, which I myself had used back in the uh, late 70s. It's descriptive of content situated in the speaker's subjective belief state and attitude toward the situation. They cite myself and Richard Dash of 2002 uh, on the topic of subjectification, which I will get to very 
briefly. Um, an example they give from Dutch is Luke, which means pleasant, uh, which is derived from lukewarm. It's of course the same uh, word as we have in lukewarm. So the basic idea here is that one can describe objects that are there in the real world and describe and describe ideas in terms of subjectivity. They are talking about synchronic subjectivity. And it can also be interpersonal. The point is different from mine was that semantic subjectivity has an interpersonal as well as an ideational component. For example, causal conjunctions as since, because, and after all, in their pragmatic uses, not only reflect the speaker's perspective, subjective perspective, on the relationship between discourse segment one and sigma discourse segment two, but they're also interpersonal. They contribute to interaction with the interlocutor. And I agree, certainly in the 70s, I wasn't seeing that, but I now agree. Uh, continuing now on intersubjectivity rather than subjectivity, which as uh, just met in first trader show, actually is hardly pure subjectivity, it's always somewhat intersubjective. Uh, Gesquier uh, in 2014 distinguished three types of intersubjectivity. One is attitudinal, it codes the speaker's image of his her, or her relationship to the addressee and codes the speaker's attention to face needs and the social self of the addressee. Examples are hedges, the so-called TV pronouns, tu and vous, in French, the polite thou, you of earlier English, and of many, many, many uh, languages. And that's what I thought about when I was thinking about intersubjectivity. And Gasquier point out there's also responsive turn-taking devices, question tags, soliciting here a response, like isn't it? So if I use a question tag like uh, it's cold, isn't it? There's a problem with this analysis, isn't there? If I use one of those tags, I'm expecting some kind of response, uh, not necessarily a yes or a no these days, but some kind of, mm -hmm, yeah, mm, you know, some, some, some kind of feedback. And the third type is textual. Uh, if I use a marker, uh, to focus something, as if I say, as for intersubjectivity, it, that as for is a focus marker. Or if I background something, like by using an ing, for example, thinking about intersubjectivity, uh, those are backgrounding markers that are textual. And yes, they are subjective because they are expressive of what the speaker is trying to convey. But they're also intersubjective because they are invitations to the addressee reader to think in terms of focus, uh, topic and focus, uh, the perspective of background and foreground. Mm -hmm.
Now to subjectification, the Asian. Two definitions are widely cited. Uh, one by Langacker, one by myself. Uh, Langacker is there on the left. I think uh, he's been on these slides before. Uh, and there's a really uh, good account of the similarities and differences between our points of view uh, by Lopez Causo, who's there on the right. Langacker's concept of subjectification is actually synchronic. Uh, his idea is uh, there's construal, where the locus of consciousness of the speaker is offstage and implicit. Uh, he's written a lot about this. I've given a couple of references, 1990-2006. And there's a volume of works on his perspective, edited by Atanasiadu, came out in 2006, in which that Langacker 2006 paper appears. Uh, here is Langacker in 1990 on be going to verb as in an earthquake is going to destroy that town. His way of thinking about this is, it's not the subject who traverses the path, it is instead the speaker or conceptualizer who traces mentally along the path in order to situate the process in relation to a reference point. So here, earthquake is clearly the subject of the sentence but the earthquake isn't going anywhere. It isn't traversing any path. Uh, it's the conceptualizer, the speaker, who actually is not present in the sentence. You could say, I think an earthquake is going to destroy that town, or I predict an earthquake is going to destroy that town. And if I think or I predict were present in the sentence, uh, then the conceptualizer uh, would be on the stage. This is thinking in Langacker's terms. But an earthquake is going to destroy that town, has no speaker in it. It was only uh, pragmatically, I would say, pragmatically inferred speaker, a conceptualizer who is conceptualizing mentally a path in relation to a reference point, and that reference point is now. This is future-oriented. But coming now to subjectification in my sense, and that of Richard Dasher, who is there on the slide, um, I distinguish itty and Asian. Those derivational affixes are important to me for purposes of analyzing historical material. Now, I, of course, aware that since we have a dynamic view of language in general, uh, the line between itty and Asian is a little bit fuzzy. But nevertheless, when you look at data in uh, corpora, uh, you can uh, see uh, differences arising. And that's what I'm interested in. So intersubjectivity is the ambient context for change, but only certain types of change involve increased intersubjectivity, increased intersubjectivity. And when increased intersubjectivity arises, this is what we call subjectification or intersubjectification. Can't really pronounce parenthesis inter. <laughs> uh, but uh, you can see here that I'm talking about both of them. So my concept of subjectification is historical. Speakers and writers used an expression with a greater degree of subjectivity than it was associated with earlier. It is discussed in Traugott and Dasher. Uh, I 
somewhat revised my views on intersubjectification in 2010. And there is a volume edited by David et al. that came out in 2010, in which that 2010 paper appears, uh, which is in some sense a companion to the Atanasio Yardu volume uh, on Langacker's view of subjectification. So this is how I and Richard Dasher in 2002 defined subjectification. Meanings tend to become increasingly based in the speaker's subjective belief state attitude toward the proposition. Tend to become increasingly based. Two important words there, tend. This is not an absolute, this is not an idea about something at that time. <laughs> not an idea about something that has to happen. Um, and the other word is increasingly. Uh, so there is this degree of subjectivity that's increasingly based in the speaker's subjective belief state or attitude uh, toward what they're talking about. So in short, subjectification is a meaning shift from less subjective meaning to more subjective meaning. It's not construal. It's very specifically a less to more subjective meaning. Now, I revised that definition in 2010. Meanings are recruited by the speaker to encode and regulate attitudes and beliefs. Now, I regulate attitudes and beliefs has a little bit more about the potential for addressees and readers in it than the older definition. Is. Now, I'm going to address some issues of debate with these definitions. People have pointed out their defects in various ways. But I'm going to start by looking at be going to be again. Now, you're probably tired of be going to be. I am. But it's, uh, such a good example that it keeps being used. And I think it's a very good example of the uh, increase in subjectivity uh, that Richard Dasher and I were thinking about. Originally, of course, it was a motion construction, motion with a purpose. But when it came to be used as a temporal semi-auxiliary, it indicated relative tense. This happened around 1630. Relative tenses are an earlier and later relationship in time. This is a moderate shift associated with assignment to the auxiliary. It's procedural and grammatical. Uh, but it's not very strong uh, subjectification. Here's an example from 1630. Where is all his money? Tis put over by exchange. His doublet was going to be translated, but for me. So the was going to be translated there is past tense. Uh, it is earlier than my action, but for me, except for me. I did something to prevent this doublet from being removed. But about a century later, we begin to find use as a didactic tense, especially in the context of stative verbs and raising constructions. This is a stronger shift. And this is when we begin to find examples like Langacker was interested in. Divers, poor authors are at present extreme busy, extremely busy, extreme busy, which looks as if there's going to be another subscription, which looks as if there's nothing in there of a speaker I. Uh, it's a nice 1720 example of the sort of thing that Langacker is talking about. Speaker is not present, 
This is purely future of when the speaker is speaking this, which looks as if there was going to be another subscription. This is a kind of subjunctive. It looks as if there were going to be another subscription. Now, I mentioned the Dismet Frustrated 2006 article, and they, and they cite us, and they uh, criticize us on various grounds. Most importantly, they criticize us on the grounds that our original definition is too narrow because connectives such as causals, because not only reflect speaker's perspective, but they are also interpersonal, as I pointed out earlier in the uh, discussion of what subjectivity entails. It entails not only the speaker, but also attention uh, to the addressee when issues come up of uh, relationships that are connective ones, like uh, as, as far as, because, and so forth. So I agree, and this complaint resonates with Hansen's definition of procedurals that I cited in the first lecture. Procedurals guide interpretations in context and point here as to particular more or less schematic frames of interpretation for the utterance hosting such expressions. They guide interpretations, whose interpretation? Not the speakers, but the addressees or readers. So if one takes that one seriously, and I do, and I've used it a lot in thinking about constructionalization of uh, grammatical items, which are procedural, uh, so are some others, but procedurals guide interpretations and point here as to particular frames. If you take that seriously, any kind of change, which might have counted as grammaticalization or that counts as grammatical constructionalization is by definition going to involve uh, some degree of intersubjectification. Yeah. Procedurals are subjective. They are what the speaker chooses to show as a relationship, but they are intersubjective because they are asking the hearer or reader to interpret in a particular kind of way. That's the job of any grammatical item. That said, I think that the two definitions of subjectification that I cited earlier still hold in general as they don't explicitly exclude intersubjectification, but I'm going to modify them later to account for the interaction with constructionization and uh, pragmatics. As I mentioned earlier, the second definition, the 2010 definition, obliquely acknowledges intersubjectivity in regulate attitudes, and when I said meanings are recruited by the speaker to encode and regulate attitudes and beliefs. Now that definition, the speaker does something, overtly states that speakers initiate change. And Hansen, Meibert, Mosegar, Hansen, who's down at the bottom there, uh, in 2012 challenged that, suggesting that hearers as well as speakers play a role in subjectification. She says that in the process of speaker hearer dyads, the so that speaker hearer pairs, negotiating meaning, the hearer is interested in the speaker's point of view and is predisposed to reinterpret linguistic items 
as expressing precisely that point of view. So she is suggesting that it isn't speakers who subjectify. It is addressees and readers who, being interested in the, the speaker's point of view, uh, reinterpret linguistic items as expressing precisely that point of view. All right. Uh, Detges and Valterite, Detges on the left and Valterite on the right, conceptualize hearers as ratifying new interpretations. That's a different way of saying addressees and readers are important in subjectification. I do agree that addressees and readers are important in change. They reinterpret. That's absolutely true. Uh, anything that involves change involves the interaction between the speaker and the hearer. And hearers and readers who reinterpret or interpret differently are crucial in change. However, that interpretations are manifest only when they produce new uses as speakers and writers. Or we could say that their ratifications are manifest only when they produce new uses as speakers and writers. Uh, I would, uh, if it may go back, please. Well, I, I, I remember it anyway. Uh, there are some things that, some cases of subjectification that are very unlikely candidates for adversary reader interpretations of what a speaker writer meant. And I, here I'm thinking of performative use of speech act verbs. I promise to do something. All speech act verbs, I think, originate in reports about various kinds of actions that can be done in speaking. Uh, so historically, you will find the promise was used a lot in descriptions of what people did. And then you suddenly begin to find examples I promise to X. That is a later use than the uh, speech act verb itself. It's the elocutionary speech act verb being used as an action by the speaker. Perhaps uh, you can, in the uh, question comment time, suggest ways in which I promised to X uh, could be a case of an addressee trying to think about the speaker and interpret what the speaker wants to say and then producing a new use. I, I find it hard to see how the such examples would fit uh, the ratifying analysis and particularly the Hansen analysis. So it seems to me that if hearers ratify or if hearers interpret in the way that Hansen says, it's only when they turn around and are speakers that they give evidence of this interpretation. So it is has to be speakers and writers who initiate the change. So on to intersubjectification. I've defined it as the development of meanings that encode speakers, writers' attention to the cognitive stances and social identities of addressees. And it's the mechanism whereby meanings once subjectified may be recruited to encode meanings centered on the addressee. 
And it's that second, once subjectified, uh, that has come under question. Next, please. The once subjectified part is questioned by Gesquier, who's there on the right, and is countered by the example of the rise of discourse structuring markers that I will get into later. I mean, I now recognize uh, there was a mistake there in, in my thinking, but as I said at the beginning, I was so focused on grammaticalization and directionality and uh, thinking of one preceding another that uh, at that time I, I didn't fully understand uh, what is actually going on in my present view <laughs> uh, as speakers and writers negotiate meaning. So the one subjectified part is going to disappear in my de definition when revised later. But the gradients of intersubjectification uh, remains unquestioned. It is a more or less affair. Uh, one could object, though I haven't seen anybody object, but I have now objected, <laughs> that both subjectification and intersubjectification pertain to conventionalized pragmatics, as in the meaning of discourse markers like but not at all. But because the definitions were created in the context of work on semantic change, uh, the term encode was used. That has to go. Uh, when one goes beyond thinking about semantic change. Next, please. So I'm going to exemplify with two domains where intersubjectification is linked, con constructionalization and constructional changes. One is the development of discourse structuring markers, such as by the way, which I actually talked about in my uh, lecture in the summer uh, uh, at Aperlin, and development of emphasizers such as pure. But before I do that, I'd like to say another word about procedural uh, used as an adjective because this is really important. I did talk about it earlier, uh, not only today, but on other occasions. Uh, but by way of reminder or uh, background for what I'm going to talk about. The term comes from Diane Blakemore, 1987, who contrasts procedural with conceptual meaning. And conceptual meaning for her refers chiefly to lexical meaning, it does for me too, except I usually call it content for meaning. And procedural meaning for her, like more, uh, refers to grammatical meanings associated with markers like tense aspect, modality, connectives, and discourse markers. My examples today have procedural meaning in that they point hearers to interpreted frames, that's Hansen's uh, way of thinking and have at least semi grammatical status. At least semi grammatical is pure because pure isn't a full uh, grammatical uh, adverb yet. Uh, discourse structuring markers are procedurals in the sense, in the noun sense, of these are expressions with little conceptual content, but a huge amount of pragmatic content. I would say that uh, tense is a very pragmatic notion, uh, particularly as I mentioned with the going to verb, the didactic tense, uh, which you get with will, shall, um, as modals are uh, subjective in terms of where they scale things on a uh, scale of obligation or of certainty, 
So getting to the discourse markers. In English, there's a large number of discourse structuring markers, which are abbreviated as DSMs, with metatextual meaning that gives clues to how the connection between discourse segment one, which I abbreviate as D1, and discourse segment two, which I, I abbreviate as D2, is to be understood. Uh, you're probably familiar with, with these from Fraser 1996 and many other publications. He calls them discourse markers, but uh, his view of discourse markers is that they are connectives and they are a subset of pragmatic markers such as Schiffrin talked about. The terminology is, is all over the place here. But let me just say that for me, discourse structuring markers are these connectors that connect discourse segment one and discourse segment two. Many derive from adverbials of space, for example, instead and by the way, uh, or from adverbials of time, like rather or furthermore. A few derive from adverbials of manner. It's not very frequent, but there are some, like incidentally, and a few even fewer uh, derived from, from nominal use of adjective phrases like all same and all in all. All the same is a pronominal, all the same things, and all in, as in all in all things. Those are pronominal pro uses of adjective phrases. Now, by the way, it started out as a spatial. Uh, you're going along the way, along the route. Uh, typical syntactic context with the change from a circumstance adverbial of spatial direction is topicalized use. And, and another discourse context constraint is that talk is going on while there is motion along the path. And four, which is from Shakespeare, illustrates both of those framing contexts for change. Tell me how far it is thither. And by the way, tell me how Wales was made so happy as to inherit such a haven. So tell me how far something is to another place. And, uh, and they talk about going there. And by the way, along the way, this is a circumstance adverbial. And by the way, tell me how Wales was made so happy. So as we go en route, tell me something. Now those two contexts appear over and over again. Topicalization, I would say, is a syntactic context. It puts, by the way, the adverbial circumstance adverb at the beginning of the clause. But it is, of course, also discursive because it puts it at the beginning and in that sense uh, makes it uh, particularly important. Uh, and then there's also talk. Uh, which is a, <clears throat> only a discourse context. And typically when an adverbial is used as a discourse structuring marker, it is monofunctional. It means just one thing. And over time, it may come to mean many things and become what I call a discourse marker. So that first step, use of an adverbial as a discourse 
structuring marker is a constructionalization. What you have is a circumstance adverb, which is syntactically an adverb, and normally occurs anywhere in the clause, but most particularly uh, at the end of the clause. Uh, being used at the beginning of the clause as a connective uh, with a connective meaning. So that is a constructionalization. It's got a new form, which is the position, and it has a new meaning, which is the connective meaning. It involves some subjectification and some intersubjectification by default. As discourse structuring markers signal how the speaker writer conceptualizes the relationship between D1 and D2 and wants the addressee reader to understand that relationship. That is the point uh, that several uh, people have made about the relationship between subjectification and intersubjectification. They really go hand in hand in the case of procedurals. And if it occurs, as it did have with, uh, by the way, uh, later use as a discourse marker is a post-constructionalization, constructional change. Uh, I am restricting the word discourse marker to multifunctional discourse structuring markers. The terminology doesn't really matter. The point is that it's, it's uh, multifunctional. So to give an example of these uh, changes in the use of by the way, we begin to find uses of by the way, meaning in passing in the text at the beginning of the 17th century. And at this point, it's monofunctional. All it means is, uh, as an aside, at this point in the text. So, this, which city is now dwindled to nothing? Uh, city was a city in Wales. Uh, reader, by the way, I observe that cities in surname the Great come to little at last. Well, uh, in five, the writer is signaling that this D2, I observe that cities to name the great come to little at last, involves a topic shift. It's going from a particular city to a generalization. And makes out as if it's in the side, makes out as if it's not a great relevance, makes out that it's a digression, when it's in fact it's not, it's the main point. There's something always as if a digression, as if this is an aside, as if uh, this is unimportant uh, in the development of, by the way. So constructionization of the, by the way, adverbial or any other adverbial as a discourse structuring marker is a case of both low subjectification used to express speaker writer stance to the connectivity between uh, D1 and D2, and at the same time, low intersubjectification, speakers writers cue the addressee and reader as to how to interpret this connectivity. And thought about that way in such changes, intersubjectification clearly does not occur later than subjectification as I originally proposed. So I agree with Gesquier on that point. And using Croft's model, which uh, I see is misdated, it should be 2001, sorry. Uh, using his 2001 model that I have used before, 
By hypothesis, whenever an adverbial or other construction is used as a discourse structuring marker, it will come to inherit, in constructional terms, it will come to inherit the following characteristics. By default, it just happens when something is recruited or is used as a discourse structuring marker. It will become a conjunct, so it'll become a connective syntactically. Pragmatically, it will have low subjectivity. Pragmatically, it will have low intersubjectivity and its discourse function is going to be as a discourse group structuring marker. Now, uh, as I mentioned, subject to cheat subjectification can be increased. I gave the example of be going to verb. So intersubjectification can also increase. And by the way, came to be intersubjectified in the 19th century. It was used as a hedge to appear to attenuate the force of D2. And this is a constructional change. Example six is one of my favorite examples of, by the way, comes from a play by Shaw in 1897. And Richard says, so I hear you are married pastor and that your wife has a most ungodly allowance of good looks. No effort here to attenuate or hedge um, but then there's a long discussion of the propriety of saying this as she is present. And you can go on to all the same, Pastor. I respect you more than I did before. By the way, did I hear or did I not that our late lamented Uncle Peter, though unmarried, was a father? Well, please remember, this is 1897. And... having children out of marriage was considered rather shocking in those days. And one would presumably think it was even more shocking for a pastor. It was a, uh, who serves in the church. And what I find so interesting about this one is that all the same, that is a discourse marker, and this is a contrastive, and immediately you know, as a speaker of English, immediately you know that is countering something that proceeds. And what proceeds was all this discussion about the propriety of saying in front of the pastor's wife how good she looked. And then he goes on to say, I, I'm sorry, may I have the example back? Thank you. All the same, Pastor, I respect you more than I did before. I respect you more than I did before raises all kinds of pragmatic uh, problems. And then we get, by the way, which up to this time, for the most part, had been used just as, well, it's an aside, and it's not very important. But it's used here to introduce something that is very important. And as I said at the time, quite shocking. And it's prevarication all over the place here. By the way, did I hear or did I not that? Uh, so what we have here is an example of further intersubjectification because uh, by the way, it's always intersubjective in some sense. But here it is being used in a very fake way to attenuate the force of what is clearly a kind of accusation. Did I hear or did I not that our lamented uncle was a father? Uh, 
So this is increased into subjectification of something that is already slightly into subjective. That's all I'm going to say at the moment about uh, discourse structuring markers. Uh, there are many, many more examples that one could use. All the same as a very interesting one, uh, but I won't do that. I want to give an example of emphasize the use of adjectives. Uh, uses of adjectives like pretty, pure, mere, which meant undiluted and meant pure, whole. They originate as adjectives that are purely uh, contentful and descriptive. And many people have written about them. Now the source adjectives are themselves evaluative and somewhat subjective. Pretty is certainly an evaluation of uh, what something looks like. By the way, uh, it originally meant uh, sort of sassy. Uh, it was an attitude, not a, a description of what people looked like. Um, so pure, that's an evaluation. Mere, meaning undiluted, is definitely an evaluation. And so is whole, to say that something is complete. But they become more subjective, I would say, and so would uh, Van der Winkel and David say in 2008, they become more subjective when they are used to scale their complement. And in fact, they don't mean exactly the same thing anymore. Van der Winkel, unfortunately, I don't have a photograph, but Kristen David say is on the right there. Uh, Van der Winkel and David say 2008 show how pure, in a really nice article, how pure came to be used to scale nouns, for example, pure filth and adjectives. He's pure good, actually. That's from uh, Ronald McCauley in 2006, uh, cited in uh, Van der Winkel and, and David say. He's pure good. I don't think we consider that standard English, but it's very definitely uh, on the street English. Now, Van der Winkel and, and Dalitzi proposed two paths uh, for the development of descriptive pure. I don't really see that we need two paths. Uh, I think they use, uh, they think about two paths because uh, they are dated slightly differently, uh, but uh, it seems to me that these are basically the same sort of change. Anyway, around the 14th century, uh, we start getting pure, uh, which means morally untainted, uh, being used uh, as an emphasizer uh, with a head of more and more different uh, nouns. This is host class expansion. He grew pale with pure annoyance. Well, pure as morally untainted doesn't go with annoyance, obviously. What it's doing there is not meaning, not being used in the, un, uh, in the untainted morally sense, but is being used in the unmixed and uh, extreme end of scale sense. Uh, the other path they talk about is modify and modify head, as in pure white marble, uh, where pure white is not untainted morally, but is unmixed white marble that has no marks of other colors in it. And it becomes 
in the modifier, modifier head uh, construction, it becomes an emphasizer. He's shown all over with pure civic pride. Pure civic pride is pure, is it extremely, uh, obviously civic in his pride. It's attested from the 13th century on, but it was infrequent until the 1850s. Uh, Führer, I think, is a very good example of gradual changes in shifting context. Was there constructionalization? Yes, because Pure came to be used in the emphasizer schema. Uh, Gersquier talked about whole, total, and complete, all of them uh, becoming emphasizers. Members of the schema are semi grammatical, they are still relatively contentful, uh, they may become grammatical. For example, very. Very was originally an adjective, as Adamson talked about. Uh, very meant true. It's French verre, borrowed from French, meaning true. Uh, Chaucer talks about a very parapet, gentle knight, a well known uh, quotation. Because that's an ambiguous one. He was a true, perfect, gentle knight. Or was he a very gentle, perfect knight? That's a nice so called bridging context where you get ambiguity, uh, enabling ambiguities. And Adamson talks about that. Adamson 2000 was on a previous slide. It was in, uh, her, uh, uh, her article should be in the references. Uh, it, it's a very interesting article uh, focusing on very. Uh, a lot of people seem to be surprised that very was originally an adjective and it meant true. And then it became uh, an emphasizer, a truly something particularly in a modifier-modifier construction. And finally, it became what I think anybody nowadays would consider to be a true adverb. Now, there's also debate about the status of adverbs. Uh, some adverbs are hugely contentful. Uh, those are mainly manner adverbs like uh, rudely, frankly, etc. They're very lexical. But then there's a set that scale their compliments, like very truly in the emphasizer sense. And those are on the procedural end of the uh, continuum from lexical to grammatical. Back to Van der Le Notte and um, Davidse, they show that the changes are modulations in context of expanding host class nouns. So we go from things that can be undiluted uh, in a very literal sense to very abstract things like annoyance. Emphasize our uses of manifest, manifest subjectification. Emphasizing pure expresses the speaker writer's stance. Uh, the, what they call a second change, as I say, I think it doesn't need to be a second change. Uh, but anyway, the change in the modifier, modifier head to emphasize as a modifier head. Construction supports Adamson's hypothesis that adjectives come to be used or can come to be used as emphasizers in leftmost position in the uh, 
in the DP in, in the nominal phrase. Uh, the adjective function in the process is becoming marginalized, decategorialized, for any uses of dispreferred for emphasizer function. Uh, this happened to several, like out, utter. Utter comes from outer. You don't say, uh, this problem is utter. You can only say this is an utter problem. That's a big problem. Mere, which used to mean pure and undiluted, has been downgraded to meaning something like less uh, than valuable. Um, these are no longer used as predicates. You don't say uh, that annoyance is mere. You can only say that is a mere annoyance. And what you mean by it is a small annoyance as opposed to pure annoyance, which is a high on the scale. But these, these items very clearly scale. And I'm going to show a figure in the next slide that shows the structure of the pre-nominal string, the expanded DP in present day English. And maybe uh, if I have, you know, uh, this, this is upcoming. There's going to be an arrow under the box that shows the historical trajectory of adjectives like pure, mere, and whole from a descriptive modifier to a strengthening, emphasizing modifier. And uh, as I mentioned, semi adjective refers to the class of adjectives that do not function as predicates. And mod is short for modifier. Here, here's the uh, here's the figure. Now that top box, determination, emphasize a description head, is a DP in modern English. Things that are determiners are things like the and er uh and some and uh, a whole lot of quantifiers. Uh, modifiers are emphasizers or can be modifier, modifier, which would both be descriptions but we're talking about pure here and whole. So what we get after the determiner is an emphasizer. We can get an emphasizer and then a description. Now, historically what happened was you got determination, modifier, modifier, uh, description, description. But historically what we have is that descriptive modifiers can be used as emphasizers. And this is basically uh, described in Geskier and it's described in Ad Adamson, but you get a shift of descriptive modifiers to strengthening modifiers. So you get pure and whole, uh, followed by descriptive modifiers like unearthly, civic, and new. So the pure unearthly ecstasy, this is an example. Uh, the pure civic pride, or just pure civic pride without a determiner, and a whole new thing that is uh, from Geskier's work. Uh, I, I hope it's clear, very hard with these slides that are uh, successive slides, but anyway, the point is that uh, you get a, in this. Uh, way of showing things, uh, a kind of leftward movement of a descriptive modifier becoming a strengthening modifier. And when an adjective is used as a member of the emphasizer modifier schema, by hypothesis, it comes to inherit the characteristics of that schema as uh, will appear shortly in figure three, because it is already evaluative and somewhat subjective when used as a regular modifier, pure, uh, whole, as I mentioned, those are subjective evaluative uh, adjectives to start with. It comes to be used more subjectively when it is used as an emphasizer modifier and is subjectified. At the same time, there's a low degree of intersubjectification 
as this emphasize a modifier schema index is scaling for the address C reader. And again, using Croft's model, and I got the date correct this time, 2001. Uh, anything that becomes an emphasizer modifier uh, is going to be semi-adjective. I mean, there might be others, but those are the ones that have been studied. It's a semi-adjective. It's going to occur as a post-determiner after the determiner. Pragmatically, it will have uh, low subjectivity and low intersubjectivity uh, and scales the, uh, what follows it. Its discourse function is an emphasizer. But of course, if you start out with something that is already subjective, it's going to get to be more subjective. If you start out with something that is already intersubjective, it will be more intersubjective simply because it is used as an, in, as an emphasizer modifier. So my new thinking is that subjectification and intersubjectification are meaning changes that arises when a constructionalization of a certain type occurs. It's a default change consistent with a schema to which an extant construction is recruited. Subjectification into subjectification can also be associated with some post-constructionalization constructional changes. Uh, and this is constrained by the construction by which they're sanctioned. So that by the way example uh, can only really become a hedge because it expresses a digression and uh, expresses the idea that what is upcoming is unimportant. Uh, so if you're being polite, you're in essence saying that something is not terribly important. Uh, I, I, I'm sorry, I hadn't, can, can, we, can you go back please? Thank you. Uh, several papers in Bramps at all of 2014 suggest, and especially the paper by Narog and Gasquier at all, when we consider modal or text marking developments at least a low level of both subjectification and intersubjectification are usually involved. So, I would say that any time something becomes a modal, just like any time something becomes a, uh, one of these emphasizer modifiers, uh, there will be at least some degree of both subjectification and intersubjectification because they have become procedurals. So, as a generalization here, by hypothesis, speaker writer has address C reader in mind when using any expression as a procedural. So I now conclude that any new procedural will minimally inherit low subjectivity and low intersubjectivity from the schema to which it is recruited. Subjectification into subjectification of a particular construction will have occurred at a low level. This is a default of the functional change and the task to which the expression is put. And that is a rather different way of thinking about subjectivity and subjectification and intersubjectification from what I had before. It's very dependent now on a constructionalization way of interpreting a uh, change. Since discourse structuring markers are procedural changes resulting in the use of an expression as a metatextual discourse structuring marker will result in a new procedural 
four meaning pairing and both subjectification and intersubjectification will occur at low levels. Well, it's a, just a different way of saying what I've said several times. This is because discourse structuring markers manifest speaker writer's concept of the relationship between D1 and D2 and cue the addressee reader with respect to that relationship, as Fraser has pointed out for decades. And when we've got adjectives like pure that are already evaluated in their descriptive uses, they acquire greater subjectivity when they're used in the emphasizer modifier schema and also low intersubjectivity. The addressee reader is invited to construe a scale. And as I said, as I said, in particular cases, either subjectivity or intersubjectivity may be higher on the continuum of intersubjectivity at the time of constructionalization, depending on the degree of intersubjectivity of the schema itself. So epistemic, epistemic pragmatic markers like probably, which derives from provable and likely, and emphasizes like pure will be higher on the subjective than the intersubjective continuum. But social pragmatic markers like P, please from if you please will be higher on the intersubjective than the subjective continuum. This suggests that the degree and type of subjectification or intersubjectification of a particular construction will at the time of constructionalization be predictable from a combination of the intersubjectivity of the construction that is undergoing the change, that is the source, and the intersubjectivity of the schema to which is recruited, which is the target. And later constructional changes are not predictable, but are likely to result in increased subjectivity or increased intersubjectivity. That gives me, or us, revised definitions. I'm thinking now of subjectification in the following way. Meanings of constructions may become increasingly based <clears throat> in the speaker's subjective belief state or attitude as the result of constructionization and constructional changes. <clears throat> Excuse me. You will recognize that this is somewhat similar to the original definition, increasingly based in the speaker's subjective belief state or attitude. But now uh, what's different about it is that it's the result of constructionalization. It's not an enabling factor as I originally thought as a result of constructionization and constructional changes. Intersubjectification now, I think, in the context of thinking about constructionalization, meanings of constructions may be modulated to acknowledge the cognitive stances and social identities of addressees as a result of constructionalization and constructional changes. So my whole rethinking of this is the result of the process of constructionalization and constructional changes. This raises an interesting question. Does desubjectification occur? What would this entail? It would entail the loss of the speaker-based meaning. Yes, that does occur. That does occur. Lexically, when evaluative terms are used for technical meaning like degeneracy in Van der Velde, a technical term from, which he says is a technical term from evolutionary biology for the phenomenon that structurally different elements can fulfill the same function. Uh, that term, if it was used as a technical term derived from common use of the language, that term has definitely been desubjectified. And I think in many cases, when you have 
uh, terminology that is professional terminology, uh, whether it's in the sciences or in linguistics or in any other field, uh, there is a the potential that something uh, will come to be used less subjectively than the everyday use of the term. I would suspect that desubjectification occurs only partly, partially with procedurals, because uh, anything that's a procedural, as I pointed out, is by definition somewhat intersubjective. Uh, you have to have a case of something which, of course, has been discussed in the degrammatical session literature of a particular grammatical item being used as a non-grammatical item. Now, a uh, progressive ing is an interesting possible case here, or has been claimed to be a case of desubjectification. Now, Susan Wright, now known as Susan Miss Fitzmaurice, in 1995 wrote about the progressive ing, uh, as an instrument for registering a speaker's experiential interpretation of an event or situation. An example is I'm combing and curling and kissing this lock all day and dreaming on it at night. Ing, 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 ing is all an experiential uh, interpretation. Uh, this, she argues, and others have argued, uh, is the use, general use of ing uh, in the 17th and 18th century. In her book on degrammaticalization, Norde, 2009, discusses Kranich's 2008 finding that the subjective experiential force of the progressive became neutralized as the progressive came to be increasingly entrenched in the tense aspect system. Now that could be argued to be a case of desubjectification because it's not used anymore in an experiential sense if Kranich is right. However, there is still some degree of subjectivity. We use ing for backgrounding uh, that in any grammar of English is supposed to be its main use. And that is, of course, uh, a subjective choice to use something as backgrounding. Uh, the sun was shining when we did X and Y. Well, if I use that expression, the sun was shining with ing, I have selected for you as the addressee. Uh, to use the sun was shining as the background to the event. I could have said the sun shone and we did this and that and the other. But if I said the sun shone, I'm not backgrounding it. I'm just giving you uh, information about the context for the event. So ing still has a subjective meaning. Uh, it's not the same subjective meaning. It's not the experiential meaning of the uh, 17th and 18th centuries, but it is still subjective. I would argue that a form of procedural could become non-subjective only if it were to be used as a non-evaluative lexical item. And whether or not that happens remains, I think, to be investigated. Norda doesn't explore that possibility because she's talking about morphology and bound morphemes. Uh, but it is a future research topic. Another future research topic is, does de-intersubjectification occur? And that would entail loss of meaning that pays attention to the addressee reader. Lexically, yes, this happens. Uh, taboo terminology uh, is often uh, de-intersubjectified because taboos uh, 
change uh, societally. Uh, Hawk and Joseph cite uh, 19th century taboo avoidance of the word leg, particularly for women in the 19th century, and uh, people used the word limb instead. Now, uh, that simply isn't valid for any culture that I'm aware of or that Hawk and Joseph were aware of. Um, that is a case of de intersubjectification. However, we do have to recognize that expletives of various words, F words, and so forth, can be very persistent. That particular one, the F word, has existed ever since Old English times. So it just doesn't disappear. It, it perhaps becomes less forceful when it's used all the time, but hasn't disappeared yet. Uh, so for procedurals, I think the answer to the question, does de intersubjectification occur, is less clear. Speakers would have to cease to use them as procedurals. So I leave you with a research question where there's evidence for procedural desubjectification and de intersubjectification. So let me conclude. This is the last of the six lectures. Uh, I'd just like to summarize what I hope were the main points. And over the last six lectures, I've discussed aspects of diachronic construction grammar. I began by contextualizing construction grammar of the Goldberg type in cognitive linguistics at large and detailing assumptions underlying usage based grammars. And then I went on to contextualize diachronic construction grammar and usage based perspective on change. I presented the revised characterizations of construction organization and uh, constructional changes. And I think maybe it's worthwhile at this point uh, to repeat those revised characterizations. Constructionalization is the establishment of a new symbolic association of form and meaning, which has been replicated across a network of language users. As I pointed out, that definition is an awful lot shorter than the first one. Uh, but there are two very new things in it. One is the establishment of a new association. Establishment takes time, it's conventionalization and replicated across a network of language users. That is very important as part of the conventionalization. And constructional changes were redefined as modulations of contextual uses prior to and following constructionalization. I spent a long time talking about uh, differences between pre-constructional, pre-constructionalization changes and post-constructionalization changes. Uh, I argued, uh, as have many others, that grammaticalization and constructionalization are complementary since they ask different questions and they concern different types of data. I illustrated the complementarity of the approaches in the procedural domain with data from uh, the rise of semi-modals like better, rather, and sooner. And I uh, neglected in this particular presentation today to say that better is a really good example of increased subjectification. Uh, so if something is good or better, that is an evaluation. Uh, the er is itself a comparative and therefore it's more good. Mm -hmm. Now, when it were better, this very impersonal, it were better for a man to do this or that or the other, uh, was the original use. of what has now come to be uh, the semimodal better, we have a 
distinct case of increased subjectification. We go from it were better for a man to do that, this or that. And uh, if I said that man better do so-and-so, that's my particular opinion. I am advising. You can see this very clearly, I think, um, I think I uh, showed that uh, by comparing you better go with you'd rather go. You'd better go as I, speaker, am advising you to go. If I say you'd rather go, this is nothing about me advising you, it's a report about what I think is the your preference. So better is a fabulous example of uh, increased subjectification. Uh, so back to uh, just a summary of what I uh, have done over the last six talks. Uh, and looked at the rise of the data from benefactor for alternations, illustrating research on domains with little or no overlap with grammaticalization, but they are rich topics for the discussion of alternation and reorganization of schemas, loss of subschemas. Today, clearly, I discussed intersubjectification, how it is intertwined with constructionalization and hypothesized that from a constructionist perspective, type and degree of intersubjectification is predictable from the discourse function of the schema to which a particular expression is recruited. I hope you will join me in thinking about these issues further. So at this point, I'd like to thank you all for your attention. Uh, for your questions, comments, challenges, and invite more of those. But before I end, I would particularly like to thank Professor Oliveira uh, for organizing uh, this particular set of lectures and many others. I think uh, what you all at Abraleen has been doing is absolutely unique in, worldwide, probably. Uh, in supporting linguistics at this rather difficult time when we can't get together. Uh, and I really appreciate the opportunity of having been part of your wonderful enterprise. So let's take a, a moment uh, to start thinking about questions. Uh, questions, comments, challenges on anything, but particularly today's topic would be much appreciated. Okay. Can we say that subjectification into subjectification are the consequences of metaphorization motivated by metonymization? Uh, probably, probably yes. Uh, but then we need to to think about how those are related to constructionalization and constructional changes. 
uh, by the way, is very clearly a metaphor. Uh, when I talk about it, I mention that it's part of the metaphor of argument as a journey, uh, where the idea of the argumentation and text production is a uh, is a journey is a well, probably metonymic to the idea that you proceed from one thing to another, but it's also uh, a metaphor. But I'm not sure that all metaphors are in any terribly interesting way uh, cases of intersubjectification. I'd have to think about that. Uh, what I was trying to do today was to think about uh, subjectification and intersubjectification in the context of, of constructionalization. So if you have a new construction arising out of a metaphor, uh, then depending on what this metaphor is doing, uh, why you're using it, uh, then yes, uh, definitely you might have subjectification or intersubjectification. Yes. Okay, once grammatical constructionization has occurred with the conventionalization of the pair, the form meaning function, to what extent is intersubjectification still important? Um, I think it's only important insofar as we recognize back to Hazelin, what is the purpose of using a grammatical marker? Uh, so it is important as a synchronic factor uh, in the way in which we use language. Uh, it is kind of default case, as uh, Dismet and Frustrated said, once it has come into being. Uh, since I'm looking at change, I see it as important in uh, the establishment of a new form meaning pairing. But once a new form meaning pairing of any sort has arisen, how it got there isn't all that important. I mean, if you think about the word grammaticalization, somebody may uh, made it up. Uh, he used a word formation process. The process itself is still important because it's clear that linguists like to use ization all over the place with an adjective. Uh, but the fact that the word grammaticalization uh, came into being by this word formation process in itself is no longer terribly important. It's, it's a historical uh, fact that it came into being, but it's coming into being is no more uh, that important. So I think your question is a very interesting one because it raises the question, uh, since when looking at language in a dynamic kind of way, uh, does the dy dynamicity continue all the time? I, I, mean, I think that's what uh, this question is getting at. No, it doesn't. Uh, I, I would say that once something has become conventionalized, uh, that means that it has become relatively stable, relatively fixed, in a community of speakers. I say relatively because it is always subject to change. Uh, cognitive linguistics uh, takes the position, and I take the position because I'm doing cognitive linguistics and I'm doing uh, diachronic construction grammar, uh, that a meaning is not inherent in a word of any sort. It's a potential. It is subject to contextual modulation. So it, 
But I wouldn't want to say, this gets me into another topic, I wouldn't say that language is always emergent in the proper sense of emergentist uh, perspective on change. Uh, that position as a strong position is a position that nothing is stable and that everything is open to uh, reinterpretation. I would say everything is open to reinterpretation, but I do think that some things are stable and stability has, in my view, uh, to be accounted for if we're going to account for puns. I can't make a pun about something. Uh, like uh, Shakespeare has an example with raisins and reasons. Well, that doesn't make a pun anymore. But it did at the time because they were both pronounced the same way. They were both pronounced reasons. And because they were pronounced the same way, they could be used as a pun. You can't have a pun, in my view, if everything is always emergent and nothing is stable. So that was a question <laughs> that led me in all kinds of directions. And I think, as I said, I think it's a question that has to do with uh, how one perceives a dynamic change. Dynamic change is always a potential. Uh, but I would say that there are times when there's a certain degree of stability and that's what's meant by conventionalization. Tell us about why Mark of intersubjective addresses participation in dialogue. Uh, well, yes, uh, back to Balfinist, back to Watanabe, back to Dushmet and Frustrated. Uh, whenever you have interlocutors in the same space, there is always intersubjectivity. Whether the speakers in that space choose to mark that intersubjectivity is a different question. If I address you, uh, since I don't, have your name, I cannot address you in person. But I can say, uh, dear asker of the question, then I am addressing you and I am drawing attention to the fact that I'm aware of your presence. If I uh, know your name, Vanya uh, Sambrana, I can say, dear some, or not use dear, I can say, Vanya Sambrana, I appreciate your question. Uh, I am then marking my awareness of our intersubjectivity, that you are there, and other people too, you are there in the immediate context of our uh, not talking together exactly, but uh, interacting on the internet. If I choose to use a tu or a vu in a language that uses those distinctions, which I know Portuguese does, uh, I am marking a relationship. Uh, it's as well known in the history of English where you had thou and you. And uh, very famously at the end of Hamlet, uh, Shakespeare has Hamlet uh, address the king, Claudius, as thou damned dame. Thou damned dame is an insult to a king. He should be addressed as you. That was a very deliberate. <laughs> 
uh, act attributed to Hamlet by Shakespeare. Because in any TV language, to use uh, the, the, the T form, the vowel form, uh, to a superior is an insult. So that would be marking our intersubjectivity, I would say. So I make a distinction. This, this, is, this is actually the distinction that uh, the Smet and Frustrated made. There is the subjectivity. They were talking about subjectivity rather than intersubjectivity. But uh, I would say, like they say, uh, there is the ambient default subjectivity and intersubjectivity of simply being in a dialogue. But that is different from linguistically marking that intersubjectivity. And uh, what I was talking about was that you can mark that intersubjectivity in different ways over time. That's conventionalized. Is it possible to relate in general terms monofunctionality with lexical construction and polyfunctionality with procedural construction? Well, the way I presented it, yes, because I was saying that uh, discourse markers are procedural, but I would say that discourse structuring map markers that are monofunctional are also procedural. Once I start using something like, by the way, uh, as some kind of uh, marker of uh, an aside, even if that's all I use it for, uh, when I'm do, using it for doing textual work, and it is procedural in that sense. I, I have studied dozens now of discourse structuring markers, and uh, there are many of them that do uh, procedural work. Uh, for example, further. If I uh, use further, in addition, uh, instead, also, and a large number of other uh, discourse marking uh, units, those are procedural because they are showing you or signaling to you, the addressee or the reader, how I see the connection between discourse one and discourse two, but they're not multifunctional. So I would say uh, that the answer to the question uh, is uh, negative, but I will also say that those semi-adjectival, pure and so forth, uh, are semi-procedural in the sense that they are partially lexical, they are partially procedural. And in the same way, the insteads, the all the sames, uh, the alsos, the furthers, and, and all those kinds of discourse structuring markers are uh, semi-procedural in that they are closer to the lexical end of the continuum from lexical to uh, purely procedural, but they're not purely one or purely the other. You see, intersubjectification is a consequence of change of a motor. 
I, I'm sorry, I don't quite understand the question. Change of motor, do you mean change of? No, I, I, I'm sorry, can you uh, paraphrase that one? It's change of motor is what's not clear to me. Are you talking about uh, necessary change, uh, predetermined change? Are you, well, if, if you could elaborate on that question, I would appreciate it. Um, Oh, could colloquialization be considered changes of in, uh, D or into subjectification that disappeared? Oh, there it is. Older forms employed to affect addresses and conversations of change through new structures. Well, colloquialisms, yes, very definitely uh, could lead to more or less uh, subjectification. Uh, I think I used the uh, example of taboo words like uh, F words, and they're overutilized. Uh, their status is changed. Uh, if you are thinking of colloquializations like uh, uh, the example from uh, uh, Macaulay, I've forgotten. Now, which what the example was, but it was pure in uh, in standard English, as I said, non idiomatic uh, use. Uh, he's talked about weird and how weird is used uh, in a very actually intersubjective sense, like meaning very. Uh, Colloquially. So I would say colloquialisms of various sorts uh, very definitely can increase uh, subjectivity and they can increase intersubjectivity. Um, the question, however, was whether D uh, intersubjectification, uh, oh, I got some more to read here. Uh, uh, or in affecting addressees. Oh yes, well, very definitely uh, such changes, uh, this is a TV example, uh, during the 20th century, uh, there is very definitely a case of uh, de intersubjectification if in fact, I should have thought of this for English, if in fact you lose the contrast, if you lose the contrast between the T and the V, uh, yes, then you have lost a degree of, sub, of intersubjectivity. That's an excellent example, yes. Uh, is it the result of colloquialization? Yes, surely it is in that case, result of colloquialization. It's also a result of cultural change, uh, rejection of distinctions between uh, social classes and uh, age and so forth. Uh, so, the question now is hard for young teenagers to employ macho as evocative. Oh, is it a form by form change? I would say that this is an obsolescence. Uh, it's an obsolescence that is probably culturally motivated. Uh, but if you cease to have a member of uh, a set of markers, markers that might be uh, a mark an addressee marker. Uh, yes, you have definitely uh, decreased uh, the options available for distinguishing uh, that particular relationship. So 
Yes, colloquialization, usually that is a cultural kind of change. And yes, definitely, and it's an excellent example of de intersubjectification that when you lose a particular contrast. Thank you for it. That's a good, good example. What's the scope of functionality? What levels of functionality is that you systematically have in mind? Uh, another good question. All these questions are fabulous. I really appreciate them. What do I mean by functionality? I mean here simply that uh, there are a number of different pragmatic uses. When I distinguish mono or multifunctionality, uh, Deborah Schifrin, in her book on discourse markers, pointed out that AND is very multifunctional in the sense you can use it for all kinds of things, uh, not just in addition. Uh, you can use it for uh, topic changing and so forth. You can see this kind of thing arising in the history of the discourse markers. I only gave you one example you can see how something comes to be used in more and more uh, contexts. This is a host class expansion where the host is actually the uh, discourse segment, the kind of discourse segments with which things are used uh, changes. And uh, what I'm saying when I say something has become a multifunctional means, I would, uh, argue that uh, it has come to have several pragmatic uses. Uh, my favorite example of this, if, if I may give another <laughs> discourse marking example, is after all. After all originally meant after everything, after all of this. Not surprising because we still say that in modern English, after all of this. It started to be used as a discourse marker. And when it started to be used, it was used in two ways. Very, very early on, it was used as a justification. It's a justification for saying what you just said. A uh, kind of example is, as a modern example, would be uh, I appreciate your questions. After all, they get me thinking. That is my reason for saying that I appreciate these questions. If I put it at the end, it means something else, or it used to mean something else. Uh, it means a concession. So if I say they got married after all, I think even out of context, you would recognize that that, that is inviting you to think of a scenario in which they were not expecting to get married, or I didn't expect them to get married. That's a concessive meaning although it was not expected. Uh, that's what I mean by multifunctional. After all, means two very different things. Well, around 1900, it was fairly well constrained. It's not so well constrained anymore. Uh, but it used to be that in initial position, after all, it was justification, and in final position, it was concession. And in medial position, it's an emphasis. He is, after all, the president. Where, yes, that's a justification of what you just said, but also invites the addressee to say, well, of course you know that. So it invites the reader to recognize uh, that should have thought about this before. <laughs> so that's what I mean by 
multifunctionality. Um, there are, of course, many different me reasons, meanings for functionality, but uh, I think I'm interpreting uh, Croft when he talked about uh, discourse function in his uh, model of a construction um, as primarily information structuring as uh, I mean that, that really is his definition of, of discourse function. And then if you find that some, there are many discourse functions, that is multifunctionality in my view. May panel studies or trend studies in sociolinguistics contribute? Yes, absolutely. Um, I have from time to time mentioned cultural changes. I mentioned it with the taboo today. Uh, I have mentioned our dialect differences. Someone asked a question about dialect differences degree uh, with respect to uh, dative automation. Uh, yes, definitely. Uh, as I said at the beginning, not only am I not a sociolinguist, but historically it is very difficult to get hold of uh, sociolinguistic information, who the speaker was, who they were speaking to, where they were speaking. We don't, for the most part, have speech. Uh, what we have is a number of texts. Uh, before printing, they are texts that people thought worthy of uh, transcribing. Bible, uh, historical reports, homilies, so uh, sermons. And that's partly a function of the medium you had. Uh, nowadays, we have uh, texting on a cell phone, which has changed things quite dramatically. Uh, at the end of the 15th century, uh, 1476, Caxon brought printing uh, to England from Germany and printing made uh, com what I would call common ordinary texts much more likely uh, to be circulated. Uh, prior to printing, Copies had to be made on vellum, and vellum, which is cowhide, as you can imagine, was extraordinarily time consuming in creating. It wasn't on paper, it was on something that was very difficult to create. And therefore, because it was difficult and expensive and took a lot of time uh, for cultural and socio linguistic reasons. Uh, only, diff only certain kinds of texts were used. Now, I recognize all of that, I and mean, it is extremely important uh, for understanding change. And many of the things that I look like, like at, by the way, for example, uh, occurs almost exclusively at first in homilies. And uh, that I gave you a Shakespeare play, but that was 1600, well, after uh, printing. But first of all, it occurs in homilies and uh, histories and translations. It was a very literate term originally, it's not anymore. So absolutely, I would say that uh, sociolinguistic factors are important for constructionalization. But the further you go back, the harder it is to uh, reconstruct that. Uh, people working uh, 
the Helsinki group uh, have been uh, leaders, pioneers in uh, showing how we can do socio-historical work. Uh, it should be included. I would definitely uh, hope that there will be socio instructionalist studies. I'm sure there have been. Uh, so, yes, of course, uh, there will be contributions. And uh, contributions, I think I mentioned when we were talking about innovation and change. Uh, people like uh, Peter Petre have been very interested in uh, demonstrating that you can show innovations uh, by particular individuals. But you can't do it until you get to the 17th century because uh, the, even the notion of individual was very different and uh, in fact rather unimportant before the Renaissance. So the further back you go, the further back you go, the less possible it is to see how individuals contributed to the conventionalization of the, I've been talking about is constructionalization. Uh, all of this has to be factored in. Yes. Uh, with historical data, to what extent do you think possible to exploit da dialogicity? Uh, historical data, it is hard. But we do have a model for doing it with Culpepper and Q2 in 2010, uh, wrote a book about how to mine uh, various dialogic texts, not just drama, uh, but also letters. And other kinds and trials, other kinds of interactional texts uh, from uh, from the mainly 16th and 17th centuries. Going back further, it is hard. In Old English, we have only one <laughs> acknowledged dialogic text. It is by Alfred, who is a teaching text, teaching grammar. Uh, to lay people, uh, mostly uh, grammar was taught in Latin, but he uh, did an Old English version of a kind of question and answer uh, kind of pedagogy. Uh, so the further back you go, the harder it is to find good dialogic material. But yes, one should exploit dialogicity. And uh, actually, when I, I have several times uh, cited Haslow uh, and other people who have worked out a great deal that has to do with tone taking. And particularly if you're looking at discourse markers, that is an obvious place to go. Uh, but uh, to repeat myself, uh, the further back you go, the harder it is to find <laughs> this material. And I do tend to look at things that start in Old English. So uh, that's a limitation of uh, historical data. I mean, if you were working on a different language entirely, uh, like Japanese, you do actually have uh, some the Genji texts, which uh, do involve uh, represented uh, conversation. But let me put <laughs> one last thing here. Uh, there's an expression all the same that we had in that example from uh, Shaw. All the same is uh, 
a concessive. And if I say thank you all the same, you know that I mean I've rejected something, but I'm thanking you, even though I rejected it. Uh, I've asked uh, some of my colleagues uh, who work on conversation. Uh, Sandy Thompson and Elizabeth Coper Coolen both told me independently they've not found all the same in their conversational data. However, if you look at Koha and you look at Koka and you look at fiction, it's all over the place. And in TV and uh, fiction and so forth in Koka. That means people are representing in interactive texts what people don't use in normal conversational interaction. It's a very interesting uh, point. I think uh, when we look at dialogic texts, we are looking at representations of what people uh, think is conversation and uh, probably create sociolinguistically a, a particular text type. Um, do you see intersubjectification as a consequence of change? Oh, yeah, well, that's the old. Well, speakers are. Oh, that's the, that was the question I asked for explanation of. Thank you. Uh, do you see intersubjectification as a consequence of change of a motor? Is it possible to decide which of these roles it plays where if speakers are looking for that change? Aha, okay, now I understand. I think of that as a kind of teleological kind of question. Uh, is there a purpose? Uh, yes, I'm quite sure some people intend. Uh, in fact, the grammaticalization literature that uh, talks about people wanting to be expressive, uh, which uh, Christian Lehmann talked about, and later, I think it was, I may be wrong here, but Hasbama, uh said they not only want to be expressive, but they want particularly to be noticed and they're exaggerating. Uh, that kind of point of view is true to a certain extent, but it's probably a certain degree of unconsciousness about it. Uh, teenagers do want to be different in some kind of way. Teenagers have been shown to be drivers of change. Yes. Are they looking for it consciously? It depends what one means by looking for it. Are they looking for it consciously? Do they want to change the language? I'm sure that as Keller said in his book on the invisible hand, uh, some people do seek to change. And we know that there have been efforts to change the language. Uh, it's often called PC, it's being politically correct. Uh, those are intentional uh, changes. Uh, sometimes they stick, sometimes they don't stick. Uh, but I think linguists on the whole prefer to say uh, that teenagers and other people, maybe they want to be noticed. Uh, Maybe they're happy if the expression that they have used is picked up by other people, but they are not really intending to change the language. They are maybe intending to uh, make a particular expression uh, common. So my tendency has always been to say it's difficult to talk about teleology. And I would certainly say, if you look at historical texts, evidence for uh, intention is very far and, and rare, far in between <laughs> various kinds of, of texts. Now, at the lexical level, yes. We do have intentions. We make up terms. We deliberately uh, change the meaning of a term. Uh, harassment was one in the uh, 1960s here. Uh, 
there are deliberate lexical changes. I'm not so sure that there are deliberate procedural changes. No more questions. Well, thank you. They were a very interesting set of questions. I do appreciate it. And I would like to take this opportunity again uh, to thank Professor Oliveira uh, for making all of this possible. So thank you, and I hope uh, that there will be, uh, that will have inspired at least a few questions in your own mind and your own research. And I wish you all well in these very uh, difficult and trying times. So stay healthy and safe. Thank you. Bye.